Okay, I'll give you an example that's really difficult tension given your priorities, immigration. There's an estimated 14 million illegal immigrants in the United States. You've spoken about mass deportation. Yes. That requires a lot of effort. Right. Money, I mean, like, how do you do it and how does that conflict with the shutting it down? Sure, and so it goes back to that original discussion we had is what is the what are the few proper roles of the federal government? I gave you two. One is of the government period. One is to protect the national borders and sovereignty of the United States, and two is to protect private property rights. There's a lot else. Most of what the government's doing today, both at the federal and state level, is something other than those two things. But in my book, those are the two things that are the proper function of government. So for everything else the federal government should not be doing, the one thing they should be doing is to protect the homeland of the United States of America and the sovereignty and sanctity of our national borders. So in that domain, that's mission aligned with a proper purpose for the federal government. I think we're a nation founded on the rule of law. I say this is the kid of legal immigrants. That means your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. And in some ways, if I was to summarize a, a formula for saving the country over the next four years, it would be a tale of two mass deportations. The mass deportations of millions of illegals who are in this country and should not be. And then the mass deportation of millions of unelected federal bureaucrats out of Washington, D.C. Now, all else equal, you could say that those are intention. But I think that the reality is anything outside of the scope of what the core function of the government is, which is protecting borders and protecting private property rights, that's really where I think the predominant cuts need to be. And, and if, you, if you look at the number of people who are looking after the border, it's not even 0.1% of the federal employee base today. So 75% isn't 99.99%, it's 75%, which still leaves that it would still be a tiny fraction of the remaining 25%, which I actually think needs to be more rather than less. So it's a good question, but that's sort of where I land on when it's a proper role of the federal government, great, act and actually do your job. The irony is 99.9999% of those resources are going to functions other than the protection of private property rights and the protection of our national physical protection. There is a lot of criticism of the idea of mass deportation though. So one, Fair enough. it would cause uh, a large amount of economic harm, at least in the short term. The other is there would be potentially violations of our kind of higher ideals of how we like to treat human beings, in particular, separation of families, for example, uh, tearing families apart. Um, and the other is just like the logistical complexity of doing something mm -hmm. like this. How do you answer the, some of those criticisms? I guess? So, so fair enough, or, and I would call those, even not even criticisms, but just thoughtful questions, yeah. right? Even if somebody who's really aligned with doing this, those are thoughtful questions to ask. So I do wanna say something about this point on, on uh, how we think about the breakage of the rule of law in other contexts. There are 350,000 mothers who are in prison in the United States today who committed crimes and were convicted of them. They didn't take their kids with them to those prisons either, right? So we face difficult trade-offs in all kinds of contexts as it relates to the enforcement of law. And I just wanna make that basic observation against the backdrop of if we're a nation founded on the rule of law, that we acknowledge that there are trade-offs to enforcing the law. And we've acknowledged that in other contexts. I don't think that we should have a special exemption for saying that somehow we weigh the other way when it comes to the issue of the border. We're a nation founded on the rule of law. We enforce laws that has costs, that has trade-offs, but it's who we are. So that backdrop is, and the, the, the easiest fact I can cite is 350,000 or so mothers who are in prison and did not take their kids to prison with them. Is that bad? That is, is it undesirable for the kids to grow up without those 350,000 mothers? It is. But it's a difficult situation created by people who violated the law and faced the consequences of it, which is also a competing and important priority in the country. So that's in the domestic context. As it relates to this question of mass deportations, let's just get very practical because all that was theoretical. Very practically, there's ways to do this, starting with people who have already broken the law, people who have not just broken the law of entering, but are committing other crimes while already here in the United States. That's a clear case for an instant mass deportation. You have a lot of people who haven't integrated into their communities. You think about the economic impact of this. A lot of people are in detention already. A lot of those people should be immediately returned to their country of origin, or at least what is called a safe third country. So safe third country means even if somebody's claiming to seek asylum from political persecution, we'll move them to another country that doesn't have to be the United States of America that they passed through, say Mexico, before actually coming here. 
Other countries around the world are doing this. Australia is detaining people. They don't let them out and live a normal, joyful life because they came to the country. They detain them until their case is adjudicated. Well, the rates of fraud in Australia of what people lie about what their conditions are is way lower now than in the United States because people respond to those incentives. So I think that in some ways people make this sound much bigger and scarier than it needs to be. I've ever taken a deeply pragmatic approach. And the North Star for me is I want the policy that helps the United States citizens who are already here. What's that policy? Clearly, that's going to be a policy that includes a large number of deportations. I think by definition, it's going to be the largest mass deportation in American history. Sounds like a punchline at a campaign rally, but actually it's just a factual statement that says if we've had the by far largest influx of illegal immigrants in American history, it just stands to reason. It's logic that, okay, if we're going to fix that, we're going to have the largest mass deportation in American history. And we can be rational. Start with people who are breaking the law in other ways here in the United States. Start with people who are already in detention or entering detention now. That comes at no cost and strict benefit. There isn't, there isn't even a little bit of an economic trade-off. Then you get to areas where you would say, okay, the costs actually continue to outweigh the benefits. And that's exactly the way our policy should be guided here. I want to do it with, in as respectful and as humane of a manner as possible. I mean, the reality is, I think one of the things we got to remember, I'll give you the example I gave with the Haitian case in Springfield, a town that I spent a lot of time in growing up in Ohio. I live about an hour from there today. I don't blame the individual Haitians who came here. I'm not saying that they're bad people because in that particular case, those weren't even people who broke the law in coming here. They came as part of a program called temporary protective status. Now, the operative word there is the first one, temporary. They have been all kinds of lawsuits. There have been all kinds of lawsuits for people who even eight, 10, 12, 14 years after the earthquake in Haiti, where many of them came, when they're going to be removed, there are allegations of racial discrimination or otherwise. No, temporary protective status means it's temporary. And we're not abandoning the rule of law when we send them back. We're abandoning the rule of law when we let them stay. Now, if that has a true benefit to the United States of America, economically or otherwise, go through the paths that allow somebody to enter this country for economic reasons, but don't do it through asylum-based claims or temporary protected status. And I think one of the features of our immigration system right now is it is built on a lie and it incentivizes lying. The reason is the arguments for keeping people in the country, if those are economic reasons, but the people actually entered using claims of asylum or refugee status, those two things don't match up. So just be honest about what our immigration system actually is. I think we do need dramatic reforms to the legal immigration system to select purposely for the people who are going to actually improve the United States of America. I think there are many people, I know some of them, right? I gave a story of one guy who I met who is a educated at our best universities or among our best universities. He went to Princeton. He went to Harvard Business School. He has a great job in the investment community. He was a professional tennis player. He was a concert pianist. He could do a Rubik's Cube in less than a minute. I'm not making this stuff up. These are hard facts. He can't get a green card in the United States. He's been here for 10 years or something like this. He asked me for the best advice I could give him. I unfortunately could not give him the actual best advice, which would be to just take a flight to Mexico and cross the border and claim to be somebody who is seeking asylum in the United States. That would that would have been morally wrong advice, so I didn't give it to him. But practically, if you were giving him advice, that would be the best advice that you actually could give somebody, which is a broken system on both sides. People who are going to make those contributions to the United States and pledge allegiance to the United States and speak our language and assimilate, we should have a path for them to be able to add value to the United States. Yet they're not the ones who are getting in. It's actually the people, our immigration system selects for people who are willing to lie. That's what it does. Selects for people who are willing to say they're seeking refugee status or seeking asylum when in fact they're not. And then we have policymakers who lie after the fact using economic justifications to keep them here. But if it was an economic justification, that should have been the criteria you used to bring them in the first place, not this illusion of asylum or refugee status. There was a case actually even the New York Times reported on this, believe it or not, of a woman who came from Russia fleeing Vladimir Putin's intolerant LGBT, anti-LGBTQ regime. She was fleeing persecution by the evil man Putin. She came here and eventually when she was pressed on the series of lies, it came out that, and she was crying finally when she broke down and admitted this. She was like, I'm not even gay. I don't even like gay people. That's what she said. And yet she was pretending to be some sort of LGBTQ advocate who was persecuted in Russia when in fact it was just somebody who was seeking better economic conditions in the United States. I'm not saying you're wrong to seek better economic conditions in the United States, but you are wrong to lie about it. 
And that's what you're seeing a lot of people even in this industry of of sort of quote unquote tourism to the United States. They're having their kids in the United States. They go back to their home country, but their kids enjoy birthright citizenship. That's built on a lie. You have people claiming to suffer from persecution. In fact, they're just working in the United States and then living in these relative mansions in parts of Mexico or Central America after they've spent four or five years making money here. Just abandon the lie. Let's just have an immigration system built on honesty. Just tell the truth. If the argument is that we need more people here for economically filling jobs, I'm skeptical the extent to which a lot of those arguments actually end up being true. But let's have that debate in the open rather than having it through the back door saying that it's refugee and asylum status when we know it's a lie. And then we justify it after the fact by saying that that economically helps the United States cut the dishonesty. And I just think that that is a policy we would do well to expand every sphere. We talk about from the military industrial complex to the rise of the managerial class to a lot of what our government's covered up about our own history to even this question of immigration today. Just tell the people the truth. And I think our government would be better serving our people if it did. Yeah, in the way you describe eloquently, the immigration system is broken in that way that is built uh, fundamentally on lies. But there's the other side of it, you know, illegal immigrants are used in uh, political campaigns for fear mongering, for example. So what I would like to understand is what is the actual harm that illegal immigrants are causing. So the the claim, one of the more intense claims uh, is of crime. And, you know, I don't, I haven't studied this rigorously, but sort of the surface level studies all show that legal and illegal immigrants commit less crime than I think, American, I think US that, I think that is true for legal immigrants. I think it's not true for illegal immigrants. That's not what I saw. Uh, so I, in, 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 in sort of in this this part of why I wrote this book, okay, and I mean the book is called Truths, so I better darn well have well sourced facts in here, right? Can't be can't be made up hypotheses, hard truths. And and there's a chapter where even in my own research on it, Lex, I mean I know a lot about this issue from my time as a presidential candidate, but even in writing the chapter on the border here, I learned a lot from a lot of different dimensions, and some of which even caused me to revise some of my premises going into it, okay? My main thesis in that chapter is, forget the demonization of, of illegal or legal immigrants or whatever, as you put it, right? Fear mongering, just put all that to one side. I want an immigration system that is built on honesty. Identify what the objective is. We could debate the objectives. We might have different opinions on the objectives. Some people may say the objective is the economic growth of the United States. I make that, I air that argument in this book. And I think that that's insufficient personally. Personally, I think you need, the United States is more than just an economic zone. It is a country, it is a nation bound together by civic ideals. I think we need to screen not just for immigrants who are going to make economic contributions, but those who speak our language, those who are able to assimilate, and those who share those civic ideals and know the U.S. history even better than the average U.S. citizen who's here. That's what I believe. But even if you disagree with me and say, no, 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 the sole goal is economic production in the United States, then at least have an immigration system that's honest about that, rather than one which claims to solve for that goal by bringing in people who are rewarded for being a refugee. We should reward the people in that model, which is, I don't even think should be the whole model, but even if that were your model, reward the people who are demonstrated, have demonstrably proven that they would make economic contributions to the United States, not the people who have demonstrated that they're willing to lie to achieve a goal. And right now, our immigration system, if it rewards one quality over any other, if there's one parameter that it rewards over any other, it isn't civic allegiance to the United States, it isn't fluency in English. It isn't the ability to make an economic contribution to this country. The number one attribute, human attribute, that our immigration system rewards is whether or not you are willing to lie. And the people who are telling those lies about whether they're seeking asylum or not are the ones who are most likely to get in. And the people who are most unwilling to tell those lies are the ones who are actually not getting in. That is a hard, uncomfortable truth about our immigration system. And the reason is because the law says you only get asylum if you're going to face bodily harm or near-term risk of bodily injury based on your religion, your ethnicity, or certain other factors. And so when you come into the country, you're asked, do you fulfill that criteria or not? And the number one way to get into this country is to check the box and say yes. So that means just systematically, right? Imagine if you're a university, Harvard or Yale or whatever, you're running your admissions process. 
the number one attribute you're selecting for isn't your SAT score, it isn't your GPA, it isn't your athletic accomplishments. It's whether or not you're willing to lie on the application. You're going to have a class populated by a bunch of charlatans and frauds. That's exactly what our immigration system is doing to the United States of America, is it is literally selecting for the people who are willing to lie. Let's say you have somebody who's a person of integrity, says, okay, I want a better life for my family, but I want to teach my kids that I'm not going to lie or break the law to do it. That person is infinitely less likely to get into the United States. That's, I know it sounds um, provocative to frame it that way, but it is, it is not an opinion. It is a fact that that is the number one human attribute that our current immigration system is selecting for. I want an immigration system centered on honesty. In order to implement that, we require acknowledging what the goals of our immigration system are in the first place. And there we have competing visions on the right, okay? Amongst conservatives, there's a rift. Some conservatives believe, I respect them for their honesty, I disagree with them, believe that the goal of the immigration system should be to, in part, protect American workers from the effects of foreign wage competition. That if we have immigrants, it's going to bring down prices, and we need to protect American workers from the effects of that downward pressure on wages. It's a goal. It's a coherent goal. I don't think it's the right goal, but many of my friends on the right believe that's a goal. But at least it's honest, and then we can design an honest immigration system to achieve that goal if that's their goal. I have other friends on the right that say the sole goal is economic growth. Nothing else matters. I disagree with that as well. My view is the goal should be whatever enriches the civic quality of the United States of America. That includes those who know the language, know our ideals, pledge allegiance to those ideals, and also are willing to make economic contributions to the country, which is one of our ideals as well. But whatever it is, we can have that debate. I have a very different view. I don't think it's a proper role of immigration policy to make it a form of labor policy because the United States of America is founded on excellence. We should be able to compete. But that's a policy debate we can have. But right now, we're not even able to have the policy debate because the whole immigration policy is built on not only a lie, but on rewarding those who do lie. And that's what I want to see change.